Hello and welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Aaron Halevi. According to the laws of the Torah, animals that have cloven hooves and chew the cud are deemed as being kosher. However, Jews are only permitted to use the forequarter of the animal. Today, we conclude our series on different cuts of kosher meats, as Sharon and Ian Lurie explain what we can do with the shin and neck cuts from the forequarter. The next cut is the shin. The shin has the marrow bone inside and is very, very good for soup, for stewing, for osobuco, and now we'll quickly slice it for you. The shin is a particularly lean cut of meat, a very, very soft and tasty piece of meat, and is generally used in soup meat. It's used to braise in the case of an osobuco, where we use beef slices of beef shin, which is braised uh, for a couple of hours and is particularly tasty and, and perhaps underutilized by, by a lot of our customers. Every cut on the forequarter has its specific purpose, has its own unique taste, and, you know, in the old days, everybody just used the shin sort of as a piece of meat bobbing around in the soup pot. Well, no more. We take this. This is we use for osobuco, okay? And what we do, it's very easy. We fry it and brown it, a little bit of flour, gravy powder, fry it. We make a mirepoix, which is... Um, carrots, celery and onions, you fry that up, add your wine, and you just let it cook for hours and hours. And it is absolutely delicious. You know, osobuco means hole in the bone, and that's what it is. And there's your marrow. So very often what people like to do, they also like to put this in cholent, because it makes, it's wonderful for cholent, and it, you know, it needs that nice overnight during the day cooking to make it nice and soft. You get the marrow with everybody fighting over the marrow bones. <laughs> but this is a, a lovely soft cut of meat when cooked low and slow. Generally, a well-run business will have no waste. This is very difficult. It's not always the case as meat is perishable, but generally we try use every piece of meat to maximize our return on the forequarter. What do we do with the neck? What do we do with the bits that are left over? Well, we turn it into lovely mince, bourrevos, poloni, sausages. This is a krakowurst as well. And this is chorizo. This is Russian sausage, which is absolutely delicious and pea soup. There are um, cocktail sausages, Viennas, which are wonderful for cocktail party. These are great for hot dogs. You also have English breakfast sausages that we make as well. Wow, there's so much that you can do with mints. I mean, I've got, I think there must be at least eight recipes of things to do with mints. Whether you're rolling it into uh, little balls or whether you're making hamburger patties, you can make anything with meat. <laughs> I think we have seen quite a growth over the last probably five to ten years uh, with a lot of the, the school children going to Jewish day schools and being influenced to, to keep kosher at home. Uh, I think we've got to a point now where, where the, the, the growth factor is, is, is a huge challenge and especially up in Johannesburg uh, there are quite a few kosher butchers. So business has become very, very tough, very, very competitive, uh, but still uh, an exciting uh, industry to be in, and uh, I would have it no other way.
The history of the Jews in Poland dates back over 800 years. For centuries, Poland was home to the largest and most significant Jewish community in the world. It was the center of Jewish culture, thanks to a long period of statutory religious tolerance and social autonomy. But this ended with the partition of Poland, which began in 1772, in particular with the discrimination and persecution of Jews in the Russian Empire. Today, Hugh Reisland tells us more in our series, Heritage Travels. Jews came to Poland for the first time in the year 1100. And in fact, there are records of Jews having worked in the Polish mint in the 1100s, and there are Hebrew inscriptions in some of those early coins still from that period. In 1330, Kazimierz the Great came out with edicts and charters protecting the Jewish people. And for many hundreds of years, the Jews lived in relative tranquility in Poland. There were cases of anti-Semitic riots in the 1400s, but there was calm and for many, many years, Jews thrived in Poland to the extent that just before World War II, there were approximately 3.3 million Jewish people in Poland. In Warsaw itself, approximately one third of the population of Warsaw before 1939, just before 1939, were Jewish people. And there's a street in Warsaw to this day that is called Jerusalemska Street, Jerusalem Street in Poland. There is only, unfortunately, one synagogue that is operating in Poland today, and that is the Nuzik Shul. I was uh, privileged to participate in one of the prayer services at that particular synagogue, and we were told that the only reason that that particular synagogue has survived in Warsaw is because the Nazis used that building to house their horses as a stable uh, during World War II. When we went to Krakow, another large and famous city of Poland, we saw the synagogue of the Ramo, Rav Moshe Isilis, that lived in Krakow from 1525 till about 1575. And he was one of the most famous Polish Jews. The Jewish book of law is known as the Shulchan Aruch. And that is the seminal work which sets out all the laws, all the Jewish laws of observance of the Jewish people. It was written by Rav Yosef Karo, Rabbi Joseph Karo, who was originally from Spain and emigrated to Israel. But the text of that particular work was aimed at the Jews of the Middle East and of Israel. Rav Moshe Isilis, who was in Krakow, he wrote the commentary for the Ashkenazi Jews, those of the East, the Central European and Eastern European Jews. And the two of them were writing almost at the same time in the 1500s, and they didn't know what the other was doing. And when Rabbi Moshe Isilis found out that his colleague in Israel had written the same work, there was no ego in it whatsoever. He simply accepted what Rabbi Karo had done in Israel, in a, in a town called Tzfat, in the north of Israel, and he said all that he will do is he will add in a gloss where the East European uh, uh, Jews, where our traditions differ from the Middle Eastern Jews, but he did away with his work, so to speak, and only kept it as a commentary uh, of the main work. In Poland, there was a very famous rabbi by the name of Rabbi Meir Shapiro, and he lived in the city of Lublin. And he was born in 1887, and he died in 1933, a relatively young man in his late 40s. And he instituted a system of learning that is still perpetuated in the world today. It was called the Daf Yomi program. Now, the book of Jewish law and ethics and morality, known as the Talmud, has several volumes, in fact, many volumes that have been recorded over the last 2,000 years. And they worked out that if you studied one page a day, it would take one person approximately seven and a half years to cover the entire spectrum of the Talmud, which, as I said, is this book of Jewish law, ethics, morality, and history. And 
there are many tens of thousands of people that are on the program today and in fact I am presently on that program and have been learning for about two and a half years and hope also within that seven and a half year period to cover the entire Talmud. And that was a major step that was taken by Rabbi May Shapiro that has had a huge effect on Jewry to this very day. It was also a very famous rabbi that lived in Poland and his name was Rabbi Meir Kagan, Yisrael Meir Kagan, also known as the Chofetz Chaim, and he was also one of the most famous Jews of the early 20th century. And he left a number of works that have had a major influence on the Jewish community of the world today. And he was born in Poland and later moved to Lithuania. When we were in Poland, we also went to Auschwitz, which was the largest of the death camps of the Nazis. And we know that Poland surrendered to the Nazis on the 1st of September, 1939. And they then implemented the, what we know today as the Holocaust, which really started with isolation, where they stripped Jews of their human rights. People lost their jobs, they couldn't attend school. Then there, were, then there was ghettoization, which was the second phase where Jews were forced to live in confined quarters, like the ghetto in Lodz, for example, in another city in, in Poland. And then finally, elimination, which was the movement of Jews from the ghetto. And there were also Jews taken from many other ghettos throughout Poland to Auschwitz. And we brought a candle with us from a man by the name of Ruven Ziegelboim. And he was an actor and he was part of the Yiddish theater of Poland. And he had a brother who was very famous in the time of the Holocaust and his name was Shmuel Ziegelboim. And Shmuel Ziegelboim was a person that smuggled, he got smuggled out of Poland. Ruben Ziegelboim gave, gave one of the persons that came with us from South Africa on our trip what we call a Yorzeit candle, which is a memorial candle that, was you, that we lit in Auschwitz in memory of Shmuel Ziegelboim, his brother. And as we were saying, Shmuel Ziegelboim smuggled out of Poland and he went to England and he tried to raise awareness of world Jewry as to what was happening uh, in Poland. And he spoke at several places publicly and he just felt that people were not believing what he was saying. In fact, it was very difficult in defense of those Jews that did hear Shmuel Ziegelboim, it was very difficult for them to comprehend that the Nazis, in fact, were implementing the final solution and that millions of Jews were going to be killed in the German, the Nazi uh, death camps. And eventually Shmuel Ziegelboim became so desperate that people were not hearing his message and that he wasn't able to galvanize support of the world and the Allied forces to go into Poland and other parts of occupied Europe and save the Jews, that he took his own life in a hotel in London and he left a note that if people aren't taking him seriously, maybe this final act of his will wake up the world to the atrocities that were going on in Poland. When we were in Warsaw, we saw the remains of what was the Warsaw Ghetto. And it was a large wall made of brick that still stands. And it's only a piece of the former wall that stood. And the ghetto was a creation of the Nazis uh, in the early 1940s, where they used Jewish slave labor to enclose a portion of Warsaw, where, uh, where several hundred thousand Jews were kept, and many of them died already in Warsaw from disease, starvation, and many other social problems that were caused as a result of living in such close quarters. The Jews of Warsaw were taken to the Treblinka concentration camp. And today there is a memorial in Warsaw near to where the Warsaw Ghetto uh, siding was, the railway siding where the Jews were lined up each morning to be taken to Treblinka, and it's called the Umschlagplatz. And it's a wall made of marble, and there's a black band of marble that goes through the center of this symbol of the Holocaust. And that was the place where the Jews used to line up, and that is there in memory of all the victims. And in fact, they've tried to put as many names as possible of the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto that traveled to traveled their last journey to Treblinka, their names are recorded at the Umschlagplatz. 
When we were in Warsaw, we went to a monument to the uprising of the Jews of Warsaw during the time of the Holocaust. And that happened in 1943. It was led by a young man by the name of Mordechai Anilevich. And he led an uprising with a small group of people and they used the most primitive of weapons. The, one of the weapons that they developed was the Molotov cocktail, which was essentially a bottle which they filled with fuel and then they had a wick and they would throw it at the German forces and they managed for several weeks to hold off the might of the Third Reich. And this was a symbol of Jewish resistance in the Holocaust, but there was also a spiritual resistance. We mentioned the Warsaw Ghetto and there are recorded stories of thousands and thousands of Jews that lived in the Warsaw Ghetto in the most horrific conditions, without proper sanitation, without food. And their spiritual resistance was enormous. They would have prayer groups. They would have study groups. There were newspapers. There were people teaching Hebrew. And there were people that still strove under those in unbearable, inhumane conditions to keep their sanity, to keep their civilized behavior. There were organizations that were welfare organizations looking after people as best they could with the limited resources that they had because they valued life and they did everything in order to keep a certain civilized standard of living even in those appalling conditions of Warsaw. So you had both the physical resistance and you had the spiritual resistance in the Holocaust that we saw being played out in Warsaw and many other parts of Poland. Of the 3.3 million Jews that lived in Poland before the Second World War, 90% of them approximately were murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators in the years 1941 to roughly 1944. Of the 300,000 that survived, many left Eastern Europe and went to Israel and other parts of the world. But the legacy of the Polish Jews certainly carries on to this day. And luminaries, like we mentioned earlier, of Rabbi Moshe Isselis from the 16th century, Rabbi Meir Shapiro of the late 19th century and 20th century, and the Chofetz Chaim, are giants of Jewry that have made an indelible impression on the Jewish people. And we carry the responsibility of Jews of taking their legacy into the future and strengthening and rebuilding after the destruction of the Holocaust and all that the Jews have experienced throughout the centuries. In Krakow, there is also a place called the Kazimierz, and that is a place where a lot of social events take place. And there's an amazing phenomenon that amongst the non-Jewish Polish uh, community, they have an annual music festival where they play the music of the Jewish people that were once in Poland. As we said, there were millions of Jews and they had an indelible effect on the Polish community. And there is a style of Jewish music called klezma. And they have a klezma festival, which is attended by literally tens of thousands of Gentiles singing Yiddish songs and Hebrew songs of the Jews of a bygone era. One of those interesting phenomena that we see in the modern world today. Today they say that there are approximately five to 10,000 Jews in Poland. Although I heard from Rabbi Michael Shudrich, who is the chief rabbi uh, of Poland, that he thinks that there could be as many as 40 to 50,000 Jews in Poland. However, many of them do not know that they're Jews because many of them were hidden away as children uh, by their parents amongst their Gentile neighbors and so they all, although they are biologically Jewish, they don't identify with the Jewish community. Welcome back. Sir Moses Montefiore was perhaps the most famous English Jew of his time. Passionate in his beliefs, both as a Jew and as an Englishman, he became a legend throughout the 19th century Jewish world. His love of Zion was demonstrated by his seven visits to the Holy Land, 
undertaken at a time when such journeys were both difficult and dangerous. His first visit, during which he was only able to spend four days in Jerusalem, took a total of ten months to complete. The few days Montefiore spent in Jerusalem in 1827 changed his approach to Judaism. After the journey, he decided to become more observant of his faith. Although Jewish philanthropy and Israel had always been on the top of his mind, it was this trip that led to his attending synagogue more often and more strict observance of Jewish law, or halacha, which endured for the remainder of his life. Montefiore was appointed executor in the will of his friend Judah Turo, a wealthy American Jew. Turo had bequeathed money to fund Jewish residential areas in Ottoman Palestine. After Turo's death in 1854, the funds were released for a variety of projects aimed at encouraging Jews to engage in productive labor. In 1855, Montefiore purchased an orchard on the outskirts of ancient Jaffa. This was used to train Jews in agriculture. Montefiore himself donated large sums of money to promote industry, education, and health amongst the Jewish community. The builders were brought from England to create what became known as the Yishuv, aimed at increasing enterprise. They formed part of a bigger program of transforming the Yishuv, or settlement, into what would become modern-day Israel. In 1860, Montefiore built the first Jewish residential settlement outside the old walled city of Jerusalem, today known as Mishkanot Cha'ananim, or Peaceful Habitation. Since it was outside the walls and open to raids, pillage, and general banditry rampant in the region at the time, the Jews were reluctant to move in, despite the houses being luxurious in comparison to those in the old city, which were overcrowded and run down. As a solution, people were paid to live there. A stone wall was built around the complex so it could be sealed off at night. The name of the neighborhood was taken from the book of Isaiah, verse 32. Montefiore also built a windmill in an area which later became the Yemen Moshe neighborhood. The name also taken from the book of Isaiah and a reference to God being at the biblical Moses' right-hand side. The area was to provide cheap flour to poor Jews a printing press and textile factory and helped to finance several agricultural colonies. In 1973, Mishkanot Sha'ananim was turned into an upscale guest house for internationally acclaimed authors, artists and musicians visiting Israel. Apart from guest house facilities, it is now a convention center and home of the Jerusalem Music Center. The Jews of the old Yeshuv referred to their patrons as Hassar Montefiore, Minister Montefiore, a title perpetuated in much Hebrew literature and song. This week's Pirkei Avot comes from chapter 5, verse 22. Five years is the age for the study of scripture. Ten for the study of Mishnah. 13 for the obligation to observe the mitzvot, 15 for the study of Talmud, 18 for marriage, 20 to pursue a livelihood, 30 for strength, 40 for understanding, 50 for counsel, 60 for sagacity, 70 for elderliness, 80 for power, 90 to stoop, 100 year old is as one who has died and passed away and has been negated from the world. Well, that's all we have for this week's episode of Simcha, a celebration of life. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so please send us a message on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions. From me, Aaron Halevi, and the Simcha team, have a great week ahead. <laughs>